Will the proletariat have enough time to create a proletarian culture? asks Leon Trotsky around 1922. Unlike bourgeois culture, which Trotsky notes took 500 years to reach its high point in the late 19th century and had achieved cultural dominance even before it came to power, proletarian culture is defined by the fact that the proletariat came to power in Russia before it achieved cultural dominance and by the fact that this class was a revolutionary class that aimed at its own dissolution. The aim of the proletariat was to bring about a classless society and a world commune, in which, in Trotsky's words, children would be, will absorb the fundamental elements of science and art as they absorb albumen and air and warmth from the sun. It follows that the category of proletarian culture for Trotsky was a necessarily fleeting one, Trotsky did not place the dictatorship of the proletariat as an epoch in itself akin to either feudal or bourgeois society. Instead, it would be like a gateway era, one which aimed to bring about its own termination through the abolition of the wage labour system, the transition to socialism and then communism. As such, for Trotsky, the art of such an era would be socialist in nature, in anticipation of a society to come, but not strictly speaking proletarian, because the cultural apparatus of the bourgeois society would still be dominant. Trotsky is interested in those artists, such as the proletarian poet Demian Biedny, whom he describes as a Bolshevik whose weapon is poetry, who deploy old forms in a revolutionary capacity, who are inhabiting the master's house in order to master it themselves and change it from within in order to prepare the world for future generations and future creations. Art would be dissolved into socialism. It would resolve itself into a society where artworks would be divested of their commodity value and in which everyone would be able to make art. In the meantime, the question posed by Trotsky in 1922 will the proletariat have enough time to create a proletarian culture, contains for Trotsky two or even three urgent complicating factors. First, the transition to an international socialist epoch had better come soon or the revolution will have been a failure. Second, in the meantime, all effort must be spent on fighting the forces hostile to the revolution and that will take up all available energy, all time meaning there will be no space for the development of a uniquely proletarian culture. And third, the question persisted as how would it be possible for the proletariat, specifically the Russian proletariat, described by Trotsky as backward, by which he meant less industrialised, more impoverished, largely illiterate, to come up with its own unique system of knowledge production, its own culture, one which proudly renounces the cultural values and the cultural forms of the bourgeoisie, and do so all in the few short years between its revolutionary ascendance and its abolition. Trotsky, unlike other leading Bolsheviks, maintained a firm belief in the aesthetic potential of an avant-garde, and when Trotsky speaks of backwardness, this is neither simply a disparaging nor paternalistic remark, although it is also partly both of these. In Trotsky's modernist worldview and experience, such backwardness can be advantageous. Esther Leslie, citing Trotsky, writes that it is certainly victims that move humanity forwards. A film by Brecht from 1933, Kula Vampa, about a proletarian youth camp and its culture of solidarity hinges on a similar form- formulation. Who will change the world? It asks those who don't like it. One of Trotsky's key theories, that of uneven and combined development, qualifies the fact that it was a less advanced society, Russia, which was able to produce a proletarian revolution, in which 500 years of bourgeois European culture was crunched into the period between February and October 1917 achieving victory against all odds and flouting both bourgeois notions of progress and traditional Marxist ideas of a teleological development towards communism which takes in all necessary prior formations, resembling instead modernist aesthetic techniques of temporal torsion 
through montage and juxtaposition. The proletariat were able to emerge victorious in October because it began from a post of backwardness. C.L.R. James depicts a similar phenomenon in the Black Jacobins. The Haitian revolutionaries were, in a sense, more capable than the French revolutionaries of pursuing the truly emancipatory content of the French Revolution. And, as well as being un uneducated slave labour, they were, James claims, the closest thing on earth to the modern proletariat. The revolutionary period is one whereby a topography of behind and in front collapses in the violent sublimation of an old society into a new one. The last are the first, but only so far as they will themselves go on to abolish both of these positions. My question here is, how does the notion of uneven and combined development undermine Trotsky's thesis that there can be no proletarian culture due to a lack of the time needed for proper development? And how might the idea of uneven and com combined development actually confirm the potential for this culture? For Trotsky, the Russian proletariat must be educated, must first assimilate existing knowledge in order to form a new culture. He writes, The texture of a culture is woven at the points where the relationships and interactions of the intelligentsia of a class and of the class itself meet. The bourgeois culture, the technical, political, philosoph philosophical and artistic, was developed by the interaction of the bourgeoisie and its inventors, leaders, thinkers and poets. The reader created the writer and the writer created the reader. This is true in an immeasurably greater degree for, prole for the proletariat because its economics and politics and culture can be built only on the basis of the new creative activity of the masses. The main task of the proletarian intelligentsia in the me immediate future is not the abstract form formation of a new culture regardless of the absence of a basis for it, but definite culture bearing that is, a systematic, planful, and of course critical imparting to the backward masses of the essential elements of the culture which already exists. Trotsky veers between optimism and pessimism, if those are the right words. In spite of his hope that the epoch will be short, there is a paradox in the formulation. It won't be all that short. Trotsky imagines the dictatorship of the proletariat and the struggle against the forces of capital will take decades, but not centuries. <clears throat> he admits with the rational clairvoyance typical to him, by projecting our present-day problems into the distant future, one can think himself through a long series of years into proletarian culture. It is also worth noting that the activities of proletkult the proletarian culture movement formed in the wake of October and consisting of a loose autonomous federation of clubs, workers' theatres, reading groups and factory committees did not cease even during the civil war when Petrograd was under siege from the White Army. Throughout this period, Russian proletarians got involved in cosmic ecstatic proletkult activities in their hundreds of thousands. If Trotsky's formulation of the proletarian epoch and the question of proletarian culture is mediated and confusing, that is maybe because one of its aims is to represent the spectrum of debate among the Bolsheviks on the question of proletarian culture. This spectrum has Lenin at one end, Alexander Bogdanov, the presiding influence behind proletkult, who we will discuss presently, at the other and Trotsky mediating somewhere in the middle. Lenin saw the first task of the vanguard party as revolution. Socialist or proletarian culture was of secondary importance, a daydream and an unnecessary distraction during the initial phase of intense struggle. Bogdanov, a leading left Bolshevik on the other hand, felt that socialist society was inconceivable without socialist culture. He anticipated that a culture of authoritarianism would arise from Lenin's mould, a barrier to autonomous intellectuality and collective self-expression of the workers. Bogdanov had been the leader of the Bolsheviks in Russia between 1905 and 1907 
and had been Lenin's main rival for party leadership at points. He is a fascinating figure and was a real revelation in researching this talk. He represents an entire strand of Bolshevik philosophy that was driven under and went largely untapped. Maria Chehonadsky's work on Soviet epistemology unearths this very astonishing strand. A polymath, by 1917 Bogdanov had written several texts, such as A Course of Political Economy, which was a textbook on Marxian theory developed from running workers' reading groups during the 1890s, a science fiction novel Red Star, a book called Tectology, a precursor to systems theory, and a book on philosophy, Imperiomonism. The subject of the latter book, Proletarian Monism, refers to the notion that collective labour is the origin of all elements of experience which human subjects possess and organise. Bogdanov's philosophy breaks the standard subject-object divide of European philosophy, which he describes as a bourgeois dualism, with a focus instead on connectivity, life-building, and a universe premised on a cosmic organising force, the highest form of which would be the self-organising communist society, which would thereby dispense with the need for philosophy itself. In Bogdanov's philosophy, the proletariat is schematically the highest form of organising consciousness. In 1909, Lenin published Materialism and Empirico Criticism, a direct and vociferous critique of Bogdanov's philosophy as a form of idealism that was incompatible with materialism. Lenin's text asserted itself as possessing a genetic link to Marx. It established itself as the Bolshevik philosophical orthodoxy, and Bogdanov was effectively sidelined from, the polit from political matters. This allowed him to have a leading role in another organisation, a kind of alternative communist party. A few days prior to the Bolshevik October Revolution, Prolet Cult, the autonomous proletarian cultural movement Bogdanov had conceived, was founded. As the first intellectual to theorise the question of proletarian culture, Bogdanov constructed Prolet Cult according to his life's philosophy, as a remnant of imperial monism, an art space for collective organising and life-building. The hugely popular movement lasted only briefly in this form and faded rapidly after Lenin brought it under the direct control of the state in 1920, an act which prevented Prolet cult from being the autonomous worker-led network that Bogdanov had considered essential. Bogdanov's early conception of the necessity of an autonomous proletarian culture movement was painfully sharpened by what he observed in the reaction of the European proletariat to the outbreak of the 1914 war. He puts this reaction down to the fact that proletarian culture was still embryonic at the outbreak of the war, that it was unprepared for the tide of reactionary jingoistic nationalism that the bourgeoisie would unleash. He writes, When the great crisis broke out, the weakness of new shoots of culture was immediately revealed their inability to play an independent role. The old bourgeois state culture, w w almost without op opposition, carried the day, uniting its forces with nationalist patriotic slogans. The internationalism of the working classes at once disintegrated because it only existed as a feeling or an attitude of the masses. It could only be a real force to be rec reckoned with if it were the incarnation of a particular and integral class culture, a solution required a, a perfected logic and a systematic culture. Since there was none of their own, it was necessary to resort to someone else's. This was bourgeois culture, the logic of economic anarchy, nationalism and militarism. To the practical subordination, there was added ideological slavery. Having fallen into unfamiliar circumstances, the child voluntarily went to learn from the adult. This is a recurring metaphor. The proletariat is the child, the bourgeoisie, the adult. 
In the Brecht film, Kula Vampa, which I mentioned a moment ago, a working-class Berlin family is depicted thoroughly inflected by petty bourgeois values, enforced by the authoritarian patriarch, the father of the family. In the face of this pressure, the son Franz, who spends each day looking for work on his bike, commits suicide. But the daughter Annie goes on to engage in a communist sporting organisation, where the ties of solidarity she and others form replace both petty bourgeois values and the patriarchal family. Trotsky also uses a similar generational metaphor to Bogdanov, mapped onto the lifespan of the collective proletariat. He writes that each new generation adds its treasure to the past accumulation of culture, but before it can do so, each new generation must pass through a stage of apprenticeship it appropriates existing culture and transforms it in its own way, making it more or less different from that of the older generation. But this appropriation is not as yet a new creation, that is, it is not a creation of new cultural values, but only a premise for them. To a certain degree, that which has been said may also be applied to the destinies of the working masses, which are rising towards epoch-making creative work. One has to only add that before the proletariat will have passed out of the stage of cultural apprenticeship, it will have ceased to be a proletariat. Again, Trotsky is using his skills in rational clairvoyance to provide a strangely exact time frame for both the proletarian sub-era and the place and the pace at which the proletariat will assimilate what needs to be assimilated from bourgeois society in order to transform it. This clarity enables Trotsky to construct a kind of conceit or promise that will be realised within the proletarian subject of 1922's own lifetime. We see the dialectical metaphor of proletarian child, bourgeois adult, again in Walter Benjamin's Programme for a Proletarian Children's Theatre, written in 1928. A Bolshevist text, it is an attempt to theorise the work of the revolutionary children's theatre practitioner Asya Laxis. In this text, again, we see the alignment of the child with the proletarian and the adult with the bourgeoisie in its sharpest light. The text dramatises another possible frame of reference for a proletarian culture which resists the entire epistemological system of the bourgeoisie, childhood. The significance of theatre in Benjamin's programme is that it is in theatre where the dimension of childhood, traditionally shut off and disciplined by bourgeois educational praxis, practices, can be realised. There is for Benjamin effectively a new culture that already exists in the inconspicuous activities of children. The programme aims to theorise a new children's collective and to allow the already existing children's subculture to exist in its own way, through a pedagogy centred around improvisational performance, the medium in which all other skills in Laxus's theatre are developed. According to this pedagogy, the proletarian child collective is to be given free rein to improvise, collaborate and create new forms imbued with a futurity. In contrast to the bourgeois ideology of teleological development, which subsumes and effaces the current moment under the name of progress, the proletarian children's theatre will deal with the transitory gesture making of the child the one subject who brings the futurity of communism into the present, enacting a short circuit to the new world, a replication of the substitutions of revolution in microcosm. In contrast to bourgeois education which needs, as Benjamin says, an idea to which education leads, proletarian children's theatre serves as an objective space where education can be located. This objective space becomes a site for the transitory. Benjamin writes, Childhood achievement is always aimed not at the eternity of the product, but the moment of the gesture. The theatre is the art form of the child because it is ephemeral. 
Perhaps this also resembles the transient nature of the proletarian sub-era that Trotsky evokes. And just as Trotsky outlines a clearly defined era of proletarian dictatorship before the coming classless society, Benjamin assigns an equally specific and clearly defined space and epoch of proletarian children's theatre within the life of the proletarian child. It is to take place between the ages of four and fourteen. It is to provide a clearly defined space for children, not linked to bourgeois telos, instead designed to be a tabula rasa for countless iterations of gesture and the creation of new signals, one circumscribed as a particular epoch in the subjectivity of the proletarian. Asya Laxus's practice involved a multi-sensory education, which she describes in her autobiography as a kind of ongoing synesthetic mode of play. In this, she discusses the importance of material and how the magical fantasies of children are directed into objects. Whereas Benjamin suspends the notion of production in his programme, Laxus talks about liberating productivity from its bourgeois modes. She writes, Bourgeois education was based on the development of a special capacity, a special talent. To speak with Brecht, it seeks to make sausages of the individual and their capacities. Bourgeois society requires that, requires that its members produce things as soon as possible. This principle is obvious from every aspect of a child's education. When such children play theatre, they always have the result in mind, the performance their appearance before the audience. That's how the joy of playful production is lost. The director is the pedagogue in the background drilling the children. It is the goal of communist education, on the basis of a high general level of preparation, to set productivity free. <coughs> Excuse me. For Laxis, the proletarian mode is one which accelerates production as it de-reifies the world. I find this very similar to the avant-garde art theorist Boris Arvatov, a follower of Bogdanov's proletarian monism and founder of the productivist art movement, who seems to pick up where Laxus's children's theatre ends. We can imagine a child from Laxus's theatre studio joining Arvatov's productivist movement. He writes... The proletarian artist must aspire to creatively organise any kind of material, be it noise in music, street words in poetry, iron or aluminium in art, or circus stunts in theatre. Only such technical tendencies can turn art into the creation of real life. In Arvatov's tract, Art and Production, from 1926, he appears as yet another interloper on the question of proletarian art and proletarian culture, through a distinctly proletarian culture, solidarity, collaboration, workers organising, the proletarian artist collective would socialise objects and build life. This collapses somewhat the Trotskyan distinction between proletarian culture and socialist art. As Alexei Penzin and John Roberts say, Life building is the term Arvatov used to designate those processes of social construction that have a direct impact on the defetishization and de-alienation of capitalist relations and forms, which create emancipated forms of communist life. Arvatov's focus on socialising production and objects and breaking down bourgeois specialisms, thus bridging the gap between art and society. He writes... The task of the proletariat is to destroy the bo this boundary between artists as monopolists of some kind of beauty and society as a whole, to make the methods of art education, the methods of general education, aimed at the cultivation of a socially harmonised personality. And thus, the revolutionary task of the proletarian art is the mastery of all kinds of advanced technique, with its instruments, with its division of labour, with its tendency to collectivise, and with its methods of planning. A unique electrification of art, engineerism in artistic labour. This is the formal purpose of contemporary proletarian practice. 
and he also writes, the working class, which is going to carry out the conscious fusion of the aesthetic with the practical, the formal with the purposeful, will take a different path, the path of objective purposefulness of the formal organisation of life, the path of holistic relation and holistic direction of all concrete elements of reality. To achieve the full sensation of reality, to become fully aware not only of the purpose of activity and the technique of its achievement, but also the form, the concrete realisation of reality. All of this means reaching such a state of socio-aesthetic monism where every phenomenon, every object, is both constructed and perceived as a live, practicable organism. Construction as opposed to the bourgeois composition, i.e. is built and perceived collectively. It is clear to see here how an actually existing proletarian culture was indeed envisaged and did already exist. Trotsky overlooks one and Lenin shuts one out. We are left to speculate on what might have happened had the wildly popular prolet cult with its ethos of proletarian monism, not been stifled by Lenin's regime, and had Bogdanov's imperial monism become the dominant Soviet philosophy. Maria Chehonadsky writes, Bogdanov thinks that after his system of imperial monism has been completed, it will be possible to produce a new form of monist substitution, or a common denominator for the life complexes, the total organisation or the non-contradictory theorem of social life. That is why imperial monism is the last possible philosophy. Similarly to Lenin's conception of the state and to the avant-garde's problematization of art, philosophy can be seen withering away and its demise is associated with a new epoch of the Soviets, productivism and universal organisational science that will intervene more directly in the world-building process. Under the post-revolutionary hegemony of the proletariat, it will be possible to proceed from critical philosophy to a constitutive universal science of organisation and an autonomous proletarian organisation, proletical.